Hi, so in this chapter, we're going to start to describe our data. So in the previous chapter, we collected the data, right? And so we just talked about how to collect data with the sampling, sampling bias, and all the different types of sampling and how to mess things up. And we also discussed experiments. But like once we collect all that data, what do we do with it? So in this chapter, we're going to have a really good idea of what we are doing with data and how to read the data and how to cal calculate data, pieces of statistics from our sample and interpret it in a way where we could convey, you know, meaningful conclusions, um, sound decisions, right? So, and when things are presented to you around the world, all the way from COVID-19 statistics to the, um, the election statistics, right, all those politics, and all the way to just walking around in a store and seeing certain ads and wondering what those, those pieces of data means. Okay, so the first thing is we always like to represent data visually, right, as, a, as graphically or somewhere where we could easily organize the data and tell from something, tell something about it. So the first one is going to be frequency tables. So frequency tables are tables with two columns and one column lists the categories and the other one lists the frequencies. So you're going to have a list of like raw data and we're just going to count them up, like tally them. The relative frequencies are the proportion of each category compared to the whole sample. So um, we just look at how we use proportions or we could say percentages of the sample in that category. So if we just take the example of a small set of colors, we notice that there are three colors given here, red, green, and blue, and we can construct a frequency table for the data. So let's go ahead and take a look. The first thing we'll want to do is to make the table is make a table and include a third column for the relative frequencies. So we're going to have one column for the category and two columns, one for frequencies and one for relative frequencies. So I like to make a little box and maybe put like a header. And then here's the category. And then here are the two other ones. So here's the frequency. And here's the relative. And then I'll put freq for frequency. <laughs> what is the category? Well, the category, I would say maybe colors, right? And then maybe put um, blue, green, and then red. So if I count all the blues, so this is how you calculate frequencies. Let's just count all the blues. One, two, three, four, five. Let's count all the greens. One, two, three, four. And now let's go ahead and count all the reds. One, two, three, four, five. So this means this would give us a total of how many frequencies? Well, 5 plus 4 is 9 and 9 plus 5 is 14. So we have 14 frequencies total. This means, and I can go ahead and draw maybe barrier lines between each color. That way the relative frequency is easy to see. So for blue, the relative frequency, again, is the proportion of the sample that is that category. So we would want to find the proportion of the sample of colors that is blue of the entire sample. So how many blue do we have? We have five out of how many total observations in our sample? So there are a total of 14 observations. And five of these observations are blue. So this means five out of 14 are blue. Using the same 
um, system, we do 4 out of 14 are green and 5 out of 14 are red. Now, if I just went ahead and add the fractions down in that last column, it's the same denominator, so add across numerators and keep the denominator the same. And 5 plus 4 is 9, and 9 plus 5 is 14. And you're like, we just did that. But relative frequency, remember, are the, is the proportion of each category compared to the sample. But notice when I do that and I get a total column, I get 14 out of 14, which is... You're like, that's just one. I'm like, yes, one. As we know with percents, one means, uh, let me do a different color because I used all mine. One means 100%, right? So we that's why we're able to use percentages because the relative frequencies will always be between zero and one or we could use percentages if they ask us to. Now here, um, because everything is colors, we can just go ahead and find the relative frequency by putting it in our calculator. So relative frequency is usually a decimal or a percent. So we can put 5 fourteenths in the calculator and we can round to the nearest tenths place because our frequencies are given as whole numbers, so we'll just round to the nearest tenths place, the one decimal past. So if the test digit is five, that means we'll have to round it up one. So again, this is correct, right? Because it, it's 0.4, it's supposed to be between zero and one, and essentially we're saying 40% of my sample were the color blue. And so if I did green and had four fourteenths, 4 divided by 14, I can round and get 0.3 since 8 is above 5. All right, and then red, we really don't have to do red because we already know from blue that it's the same, so it'll be 0.4. And so essentially, when I add these up, they should be 1. Now, if I do this, I get 0.4 plus 0.3 is 0.7, and 0.7 plus 0.4 is 1.1, uh, which is close enough to 1. Um, we're always going to get some sort of rounding error, as we've learned in um, prior examples. Uh, so when we do the uh, rounding, we just want to round appropriately, but also when we add, it should be close to 1. When rounding, you might always get like a little bit of an error. That's why it's important to do the fractions first and make sure that they're coordinated with the total frequency and then you can use the calculator. And as long as when you add these up, they are really close to one, uh, then it's pretty accurate. Okay, so that's a frequency table. So if we just looked at the raw data by itself, we wouldn't really be able to see which had the most amount of colors, right? But once we did the table, I could easily see that blue and red were the higher observations in the sample. Um, so we could see that there's some value to seeing a table. So after we make a table, we're going to go ahead and do bar graphs. Now recall that from chapter 8, the when we were talking about the types of data, we had two types. We had quantitative and uh, qualitative or categorical, which I like to use. Categories are, remember, like we couldn't add and subtract and get meaningful results. So like if I add a bunch of blue and green and red, I don't get like an average color, right? So recall that we are doing categorical data first and organizing that. And then we'll do um, the second part would be quantitative data, which we do obviously a lot more with. But once we make a frequency table for any data, this applies to any data, when we want to actually organize categorical data in a visual way, we use bar graphs. So a bar graph, because but we call it a bar graph because we have to be careful because they are going to be bars and they're not going to be touching. And the reason why they can't touch is because 
they like we can't flow in blue into green and green into red like there's no we cannot add and subtract and get an average color right so anytime when they're categories they are distinct categories and we're going to keep them separated and even in our bar graph we're going to keep it separated so if i create a bar graph for the colors um, this is how we'll do it. So the first thing is essentially we're going to draw the first quadrant of the Cartesian coordinate plane and just that's all we'll do in this in this class is <laughs> use the first quadrant. So if I do that, um, let me go ahead and copy this table down here. And you don't have to because it's on your paper when you're writing your notes, but I'm going to do this um, for the sake of um, the lecture and like the frame. <laughs> so, okay, so now the first thing we want to do when we do a bar graph is draw the first quadrant like so. Here, and then we could label like colors here. So notice that the category goes on the horizontal axis. The the vertical axis, which is here, will be the frequencies. And so we're going to go ahead and put frequencies here. And we usually denote that by like a psi thing, maybe. OK, and the colors that we have are blue, green, and red. Notice that when are we use the frequencies, I'm not going to sit there and it's not algebra. I'm not going to sit there and do a bunch of tabs up to 100 or something. Statistics is all about our target population, our target sample. So in here, if you notice, our frequencies aren't very high. They only go up to five. Five was the largest number of colors we had. So I'm not going to draw up to 20 or 10. In fact, why not just make it every tick mark one and separate them up to five? We really want to see what's happening with our data, not far away from our data. We are always all about in statistics staying close to our data pieces. So here's our tick marks, one, two, three, four, five. Now if I draw the color blue, I would have a rectangle where the tick mark here will be the middle of my bar. So the bar is going to look like this. It's going to go up to five and the bar will be around the tick mark. The midpoint of the base of the bar is going to be the tick mark. So usually I start like this and then I can fix it so it looks nice like that. And you can even shade it if you wanted, you know, some color in there. It's really up to you. Um, we rarely, in, in, in statistics and probability, we use a lot of technology to make our graphs. So we don't have to be too fancy here because we know technology will do most of the work. For green, we had a frequency of four. So again, draw the bar up to four and around the tick mark. So I'm going to draw around the tick mark up to four. And again, I'm on the iPad, so it allows me to kind of adjust if needed. And I can always color it if I wanted to. For red, it's going to look identical to the blue in the sense that it's going to go up to five. And I can always color that in pink. And what some graphs do in technology, they actually write the number on top. And look nice. So if you do one in Excel or in Google Sheets, you'll see that it comes out really nice like that. And that's all there is to it. Now we ra rarely do this by hand, but we're just showing you so you see the difference between how we describe categorical data versus describing quantitative data, which we're going to do in a little bit. So this is all categories. So here's the category. We have the frequency table and a bar chart. 
Those are the first two things we can do with categorical data. The next part is a Pareto chart which essentially is exactly what we just did here, except now we put them in order from highest to lowest. It likes to look like a, like a little slope, downward slope. So if I went ahead and reconstruct the bar graph using the Pareto chart, I could see that it's not going to go up, down, up, right? It's going to be like this. So I'll have to put blue, red, green, right? So this bar will be here. So I'm going to switch the green and the red bar. So if you go ahead, I'm going to go ahead and copy this so you can see. Now what I'm going to do is just go ahead and I'm going to try to switch these bars here. So they are in the right spot. Oh. Okay, like just like that. And then I'll go ahead and put this tick mark. So this is the Pareto chart where it goes from high to low, right? That's what it looks like. Now let's go ahead and take advantage of the fact that I copy and pasted and let's do it for the relative frequency. So let's do the Pareto chart for the relative frequencies because we didn't get to do that for the other uh, example. The, it's going to look similar. We're still going to have the first quadrant here where we're going to have colors on the bottom And still, instead of frequencies, we're going to put relative frequencies here. And we'll do a Pareto chart. So we'll do it high to low, but with the relative frequency. So let's go ahead and put blue here, green, uh, red next. That would be the next highest one, and then green. For the relative frequency, just be careful here. Notice that it's only 0.3 and 0.4. So I'm not going to go up to 100% because none of them are even near 0.9 point or 1 or 0 0.8, 0 0.1 a half. Like it's nothing. It goes up to only 0.4. So why not draw tick marks at every tenth place? So the best part would be we have 1, 2, 3, 4. So here's 0.4, here's 0 0.3, 0 0.2, and then 0.1. Once again, I just want to emphasize we're not in algebra. What we want is we want to see our data closely, and we don't want to make our y-axis like huge because then our bars become really, really small, and it doesn't tell us anything about the data. What I want are good vertical axis tick marks where I'm going to see the most frequent color of my sample. And in this case, that's going to be blue and red. But if I made it up to 100 and the bars are all really teeny tiny, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be able to visually see anything. The point of these are visual. It's aesthetic. So now let's go ahead and try to do the blue. So the blue, we're going to do the same way. It was 0.4. like that. And then the red was also 0.4. And the green was 0.3. So right here. here we go. And um, we can shade it, you know, quickly if you wanted. I think I actually have a red highlighter right here. And maybe a green one. But again, the point of this example here was to use the relative frequency column to make a bar chart. So you could see the difference between frequencies are going to be numbers in this column. And relative frequencies are only going to be between 0 to 1. But then you look at your relative frequency and you look for the largest and the smallest. And I see 0.4, 0.3, there's no need to even go 
past 0.4 at all because this is pretty low percentages. And so other types of graphs representing da uh, categorical data is also a pie chart. So a pie chart seems really simple. We see them all the time on the internet. It looks like we just like pick and choose colors and guess the slice of pie. But actually it's very mathematical and it's very precise in how we cut the slices of pie. So if we go ahead and take that um, pie chart of colors, so remember that uh, if I just put over here really quickly, remember we had five blue, uh, four red, and five green. So we'll just put that aside. Just remember from the, the set of colors. So how we do this is we're going to go ahead and take the proportion of the pie that coordinates with that many colors in the category. So we need to find the proportion of the sample of each category that uh, compared to the entire sample. So recall when we had our chart, it was blue, red, and green, where we had five blue, four red, and five green. This gave us the relative frequency of five fourteenths, four fourteenths, and then five fourteenths. Recall that. So we're going to go ahead and use this here, the relative frequencies, because that is the proportion of the entire sample, so the entire pie that is dedicated um, to that um, category. So the first thing we want to do is draw the circle. So I like to draw a really nice big circle. I'm like that. <laughs> and we know that we're going to have and I'm going to drop very lightly. Maybe I can find a gray. There we go. As we cut the pie, here is zero, here is 90 degrees, here's 180 degrees, and 270. Now, you're not ever going to draw pie charts by hand, but we are in a math class, and so I'm going to show you mathematically how we do it, and that way you have, you're more aware of how these pies are calculated and how presented, and you have a better idea of what the pie should be and when it's, when it's actually trying to be misrepresented, you know, and so we just want to make sure that we have a clear understanding how pie charts are calculated. And that way you can go and look at pie charts all over the world throughout your life and understand them better. Okay, so now we drew the, the circle. So now the first step would be to um, find the proportion of each color. So the proportion of each color, remember the blue um, was 5 out of 14, the red was 4 out of 14, and the green was 5 out of 14. The second part would be to find the degrees of the wedge. Recall that a full circle is 360 degrees. And we always say like if you turn up being opposite, right, the opposite of uh, zero degrees is 180. Like I did a full 180, you know, and we know a 90 degree angle makes this nice little perfect sharp L. So we start here and we start counting degrees counterclockwise and the total from zero all the way around is 360. So if we find the degrees of each wedge we're gonna go from zero degrees to wherever that wedge is and then start there for the next wedge until we get complete the full circle. So the first one is going to be for blue and I'll do that in a color about like this. So blue would be three 
um, 60, 360 degrees, and the proportion of this pie that's 360 degrees that is dedicated to the color blue is times 5 14 So then you just go to your calculator and you put 360 times 5 divided by 14. And you get 128.6, right? We can just go ahead and. Okay, so now the red would be 360 degrees times the proportion of this pie that is dedicated to red. So 360 times 4 fourteenths. And we get 102.9. And then for green, I don't really have to do anything because it's the same as blue. So that's going to be 128.6. Okay, so let's go ahead and start. So blue is 128.6. So here's 0, here's 90. So I know I'm going to pass the 90. Here's 180. So in between here would be um, 45, 135. So here's 135. So it's just going to be a little less, like maybe right here. We could use a protractor if we needed, but I think we're doing pretty preciseness right now. So let me go ahead and I'm going to do start at the 0, pass the 90, and go about where I think is 128. And then draw the slice of pie just like that. Here's the center. And I'm going to go now and erase this little dot dash line and then shade in some blue here. Okay, and so that's essentially um, how to get the first wedge. And again, we're at 128.6 degrees. Now, how do we get the red wedge? Well, I have to start from here. This is my starting point, and I have to go ahead and add a 102.9 to get this wedge of red. So I can't start from zero because then it'll overlap with the blue, right? So then I start where I ended with the blue and begin the red. So what is 128 plus the 102? I'm going to go 102, so I need to add it to the 128.6. So let me go to the calculator and go 128.6 and then add the 109 down, 109.2, uh, no, 102.9, sorry. <laughs> so it, I'm going to, my wedge will still be 102.9 degrees, but I just need to know where my ending point is. It looks like my ending point is going to be at this 231.5 degrees. So if we look here, we could see that we have 90 degrees here, 180 degrees here. So if I'm going to do 102.9 degrees from here, I'm going to have to pass the 180 all the way until I get to 231, which is about here. So, um, let me draw that red. Okay, so about here, here we go. And then here's the red piece, do it on this side. And we'll just go ahead and fill it in just so it's a little nicer. Okay, great. So here, let me mark where I'm at. I'm at 231.5. But I only have one more color, so then I know that this wedge here is green. And I can shade this in pretty nicely here. 
Um, what we like to see in the um, pie chart is usually the percentage, right? Let me go ahead and erase this dashed line. I forgot about it. <laughs> and so, um, We'll go ahead and find the percentage um, by using the calculator and the proportion. So for example, the proportion of blue is 5 14 So if I put that in the calculator, I would see that this is about 36%, right? Uh, it would be 0.35, I'm so sorry, 0.36 which is 36%. So in this wedge, I could put something like 36%. In the red wedge, I could go ahead and find that out, put 4 divided by 14, and it would be 0.29, which is 29%. And what I really need is for this total to equal 100%. So if we, as long as we're rounding here, of course, so we might get a little bit of an error, but it shouldn't be as close to 100% as possible. And sure enough, it is 101. That means that it was just a little rounding issue. And so we could see this nice little um, pie chart here. So you could see that, imagine when we didn't have technology and we did pie charts, it's a lot. You had to actually know a little geometry, right? You had to know what the circle looked like counterclockwise on a Cartesian coordinate plane. But now that we have technology, we don't really do pie charts like that. We just let the technology do it. And we should, because it's probably going to be more precise. <laughs> but now that we know um, that we use a circle and the fact that it's 360 degrees that we know that um, we can count the degrees of each slice till we go around the circle. And it's pretty easy. You just take the proportion and then find the degrees and then count, right? Just kind of make the wedges as we go. So this is the pie chart. This is another chart besides the Pareto and bar chart that we can present categorical data. Here in the pictogram, this is the last one that we will show for um, categorical data. Pictograms are good. They're not usually drawn to scale unless it tells us that it is. So here, notice they could have been doing a presentation and they're like, look at the manager's salary and look at the worker salaries. What would you conclude? Well, the first thing you would conclude, you would see is that managers make a lot more, right? The bag isn't even, is fatter, but also taller, right? There's a lot of more money in there. So, but if it's drawn to scale, that means the size of these bags actually means something. So if I went ahead and took this height here, right? And then kind of drew a dotted line here, and then drew the height of this one, of the managers. So this is the managers, and this is going to be the worker. I could see that just by aesthetic, like this length to this length, it looks like the workers make half as much as the managers, just by distance, if I measured those lines. Because it's, pictograms are made to con make conclusions uh, statistically. So we can go ahead and assume that these heights represent the actual salary number. But we don't really care about the numbers. We want to just show the people that managers make twice as much as workers. And that's not really fair. You know, so maybe it's not even the amount. Maybe it's just the principle of the situation, right? So here, I would go ahead, um, we can conclude that managers make about 
twice as much as the workers. And again, pictograms are drawn to scale. So we can conclude something mathematically or numerically on, with pictograms.